As of the last couple of days, we've gotten a sneak peek at Tesla's hardware 4, and it entails a lot of changes to the Tesla vehicles. But the question I don't think has been asked enough yet is how is this going to affect Tesla's full self-driving beta software team? That's what we're going to talk about today. Wait, that's Sabina Hassenfelder. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. First of all, I'm very proudly wearing Sandy Monroe's, literally Sandy Monroe's Aptera shirt. There is a, a, a long tale about how he literally gave me this shirt off of his back. And the really funny part about this is that he gave me the shirt and then uh, I, I wore it very proudly. I wear it, but I felt really bad. So I sent Corey, the president of my Sandy Monroe's company, you know, Lean Design. Anyway, I sent him a couple of t-shirts and I saw Sandy, uh, I think two months later at uh, TeslaCon in Florida and he was wearing my shirt, the Success is a Possible Outcome shirt, which, by the way, you can get. Just check out the merch store in the description. Anyway, he was wearing the Success is a Possible Outcome shirt, and I was like, oh, you're wearing that shirt? And he's like, I love this shirt. I wish I knew where it came from. I just got it in the mail one day from Corey. And I was like, that's my shirt. <laughs> so anyway, it's 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 a little bit of a, a, a crazy little pretzel story about all of this stuff, but I thought that was a, a, a cool thing, and I don't know if I've ever mentioned that on a video yet. But anyways, that's a complete tangential aside. Just happened to wear this to the gym this morning, so I thought about that. Anyway, what I want to talk about is that Hardware 4 it clearly has some significant differences from Hardware 3. Now, obviously, the board has an extra chip, trip chip for each one of the SOCs, so there's two extra trip chips that this thing has available to it. The trip chips uh, basically provide the neural network you know, acceleration. They're neural network accelerators that allow these inference engines to work at high speeds. And there were four between the two SOCs, and now there are six. So there's a 50% increase in them. As Green the Only said in his tweets, and I did a whole video on this, and if you haven't seen the hardware episode, consider this one kind of a companion piece to the hardware episode. So I'll put a link to that at the end of this video as well, so you can go watch that. It doesn't matter which order you watch them in, but you should definitely watch both. Anyway, he talked about how the, it wasn't as many new trip chips as people people thought there were going to be, but still it's a 50% increase. Also higher speed, also consumes more power, interestingly enough, according to Green the Only anyway. Uh, so anyway, there's a bunch of big changes, but one of the biggest is that there are now 11 camera inputs, and there's an expected going to be 11 cameras on Teslas from now on, as opposed to the eight cameras that are currently built in. And exactly where these cameras are going to be is a little bit unclear, but it looks like we're going to have two main cameras where the rear view is above that, but facing forward. But anyway, there are three currently. Uh, it's possible that the two side pillar cameras behind the front doors may move towards the fenders, interestingly enough. And then the repeater cameras, I, I would imagine, are going to stay more or less where they are, but they may actually reorient themselves to look more sideways. And then there's going to be several of them that could be on the front bumper, and it looks like there's still one on the rear bumper, well, above the lift gate where the, where the license plate is, you know, the standard backup camera kind of situation. And then what they now call a selfie cam, which is the interior cabin camera. But beyond just having three more cameras, these cameras are also approximately four times the resolution of the old cameras. The, we don't know all of the facts, you know, quite yet. But anyway, it looks like these new cameras are on the order of five megapixels as opposed to like 1.4 megapixels. So on the order of four times more data is being processed per camera. So between 11 cameras as opposed to eight cameras and 4x more resolution, we're looking at somewhere around 5.5 times more data is going to be fed into the vehicle's processor. So that's a lot more data. And yeah, 5.5 times is a lot more than the 50% extra neural network increase that we're getting from the extra trip chips, but there may be some onboard processing that can happen or something like that on these Samsung cameras. Although it, you know, famously Tesla has gotten rid of a lot of that pre-processing stuff and gone straight to raw pixels being input. So I don't know exactly how that's going to work. But anyway, a lot more data is coming from these cameras. But in addition to that, with new cameras, with the cameras potentially changing position and all of that stuff, we're looking at requiring potentially an entirely new data set. It may not be possible for Tesla's software engineers engineers to reuse the exact eight camera data set 
to train the new neural networks. So this is where things start to get really interesting because are they going to have to have an 11 camera data set? Have they been driving around cars with 11 cameras collecting this data, you know, on the order of a couple of hundred cars or something like that, test vehicles out there that they've been using to begin to pull in this data set? Or do they have some really, really clever way of transferring the, you know, because what they're doing is the vision system, of course, the first step that it does is it translates from all of these 2D pixels into a surround 3D video and then from that into a vector space thing. So that stage of the processing is very, very critical to what's going on. Then, of course, downstream from that, it has to then figure out from that vector space where objects actually are, what those objects are, the kinematics and all of that kind of stuff. All of that can relatively remain the same in my mind. And then the policy network, of course, could be very much the same, although from Elon Musk's recent tweet, and you can check out that video if you're interested. But the policy network itself, in other words, the consideration of how to actually drive the car, pressing the accelerator, the brake, the steering wheel, things like that, that's being transferred over to neural network architecture as well right now. So everything is transferring over to neural network architecture. So a lot of moving parts. But I would say that, you know, past the vision system, the, the, the recognition system, and then the policy network system could be done relatively similar to what's being done on hardware three. So that probably is not going to require a, a huge amount of reworking. But that first step, the first critical step, we're going from eight cameras in very, very specific positions on all of these vehicles to 11 cameras in potentially very new positions all over these vehicles. And that is going to make a significant change in the way that the vision system has to operate, which means that the software stacks, all of the neural networks, all of that kind of stuff has to be altered to be able to work with the 11 cameras in the new positions as opposed to the eight cameras in the old positions. And that sort of major hardware change is the kind of thing that if I was a software engineer working for Tesla months ago, even as I began to hear about this thing, this would keep me up at night. I would have nightmares about it. I'd be like, oh gosh, how are we going to handle that? So I hope that, you know, hardware for has, has been around supposedly for a very long time. It has not been put into their actual production vehicles until now or thereabouts now, but it has been around for a long time. So the odds are that they've hopefully been able to test it in real world vehicles. Also, they, they, uh, they have a very, very good simulator that runs in the Unreal Engine. So, of course, they can simulate these new cameras as well. So they could potentially have tens of millions or hundreds of millions of virtual miles using the new cameras. And maybe they've created some sort of an equivalence model where they can go like, here's the data set from eight cameras. And here's the, what would be the data set from 11 cameras. And they can project from the eight camera system into some sort of virtual space and then back to the 11 camera system so that they can produce a data set that's from 11 cameras, from 11 cameras, but it was actually only from the eight camera setup. So maybe they've got something like that where they've got this data transfer methodology because for the near term future, right, even if they release the Model Y and the Model 3 and the Model X and the Model S on March 1st with hardware 4 and all of these things from now on have that. That's not going to happen, by the way. They're going to have to roll it out slower than that. But even if they did that, it would take at least a year or two or three before you'd get the same sort of quantity of vehicles out there with 11 cameras versus the quantity of vehicles that are currently out there with eight cameras. So for that transition period, how are they going to maintain the code for both of these vehicles and train the new vehicles when there's a relative paucity of these new vehicles with 11 cameras on the roads? And my hope would be that what they've done over the past year or so or something like that is created a very clever system, maybe it's an AI system or something like that, that takes the raw eight camera input, converts it into some sort of gamified space, and then reverse engineers that back to a supposed 11 camera system so that you can then transfer the data back and forth between the eight camera vision system and the 11 camera vision system. I, I don't know that that's frankly possible, but that seems like the obvious solution to me. I mean, it's not an easy solution, but it seems like the easiest one so that you have this ability to go back and forth with your data sets. Which brings us to point number two, which is that these new chips, the new SOCs in hardware four, could potentially have a significantly different architecture than the previous ones. We won't know about that. I don't know how long it'll take to find out about that. Maybe Sandy Monroe, when he tears down a hardware four vehicle, will have an engineer who's able to really reverse engineer that eventually. Or maybe somebody like Green the Only will be able to dig into the details as well. But it could take a long time to find out. But 
if we assume that this thing is basically the same, it's just kind of on steroids, so it's basically running the same code, it has the same interface, the architecture is the same. If all of that is the same, it's a relatively simple thing to move from hardware three to hardware four. But for example, when Tesla moved from hardware two and 2.5 to hardware three, it was an incredibly different architecture. So it required rewriting things from the ground up, which put Tesla back quite a while. They took several steps back in terms of the quality of the full self-driving, the autopilot capabilities, until they had sort of revamped things. So I, at, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say it's probably going to be much closer to hardware three in terms of the sort of architectural nature of these chips. So they probably won't have to do that as much, but I'm sure there will have to be some rewrites and things like that. Now again, here Tesla has a big advantage, which is that hardware four has been out for a long time. It has not gone into production, but it's the specification has been there. So they at least have had experience with this and the kind of rewrites thing, hopefully they've got some sort of code that can again translate a lot of the hardware three architecture into whatever changes are in hardware four. And the reason why this is important is point number three, which is forked code bases. This is like the bane of everyone who ever deals in software development is if hardware three, if the architecture, if the, the nature of the software you have to write for hardware three is different enough from hardware four, you have to fork your architectures. You have to fork your code base. And I believe that that's going to be fairly necessary in the long term. It's going to be definitely necessary because of course you have to take advantage of the, the, the change changes in hardware four in order to get the advantages out of hardware four, the faster processing, more trip cores, things like that. If you're going to do that, you have to fork the code because you have to make that work. But at the beginning, they could pretty much try to balance the two and make them as similar as possible to try to match performance between the two of them prior to forking it. So I don't know where they are in terms of that, but once you fork it, then you have to maintain the old legacy hardware three stack as you work on hardware four. And that becomes complicated. And the reason reason why is because you can't upgrade hardware three to hardware four again, as I pointed out in my video from yesterday, that's not going to be a possibility. It's going to be too major of a change. It would require punching new holes in the Tesla and putting new cameras in, recabling a lot of stuff. It just isn't going to be viable to do that. So hardware three is going to be around for a decade at this point, right? This is, it's going to take 10 years plus for these vehicles to not be on the roads anymore. So therefore we're looking at having to maintain the code base for hardware three and improve it because again, all of us who are driving full self-driving beta on hardware three expect improvements and to hopefully get to that point where our vehicles can drive us around without us having to pay attention. And then of course, people who have hardware four are going to want to see the advantages of hardware four. They're going to want to see how much better these chips can actually be. So they're definitely going to have to fork this code. Maybe they won't have to do it right away at the beginning, but they're going to have to fork the code in order to see the advantages of hardware four, but also maintain legacy hardware three. My assumption again would be that they have already done this internally, but that requires an entire team to be maintaining hardware three and an entire team to be maintaining hardware four, and they have to talk to each other. And this is a very, very complex task. This is not something that you know, anybody would want to take on. It's going to require an increase in the size of the team. At least I imagine that because they're going to need people to work on both. It also then hardware three becomes the less sexy version, right? If you're stuck on that, you're like the B team. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, everybody is probably going to want to work on the new toy, the new hotness. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, I want to work on that. I don't want to work on this legacy stuff that's like old. It's like, ah, oh, those are chips that have been around for a long time. Who cares? So it's going to even be on an emotional level, a challenge for Tesla to maintain a team that has an excitement about hardware three. And above the new cameras and more data and above the way that the architecture of the SOCs could be slightly changed and things like that, I think the forking of the code is going to be the biggest challenge for Tesla. How they deal with that, I think, again, if they can automate things so that there's as much pass through between hardware three and hardware four code as possible, there's automatic translation tools, there's things like that. That would be the way that I imagine that they could keep things as similar as possible while still maintaining two code bases 
services that still work on individual architectures. Obviously, I don't know anything. I'm just speculating from the outside, so I want to be very clear about that. But these are the things that I see that would seem to be the best way. If you've worked in a software company, you know, that has had to fork code in a substantial way like this, I would love to hear your comments in the comments section because I would love to know how you manage something like that and, you know, sort of what period of time you maintain the legacy software at that point in order for your previous customers to feel satisfied about what they had invested in. And of course, if anybody from Tesla wants to talk to me about that, I would love to talk to you. Even if it's off the record and I can't talk about it publicly, I would be super interested just from my own personal knowledge to find out how you all are dealing with that. And of course, if you feel like you can talk about it publicly, that would be amazing. So I would totally love to do that. It's an open invitation. DM me on Twitter. I'd be happy to talk to you. In the meantime, of course, I am super excited to see Hardware 4 and its amazing new capabilities. I also really, really hope that Tesla does right by us Hardware 3 customers because there are a lot of us out there right now. In fact, there is 362,750 something. I talked about that yesterday too in a video. Anyway, there's all these people who are you know having their, their automobiles recalled, which is just an over-the-air software update. There are hundreds of thousands of full self-driving beta users in the United States right now who are utilizing Hardware where three, all of us are. And so there's a lot of people who are like, hey, <laughs> we want to make sure that our hardware three is still being supported as you move on to hardware four. So anyway, is this an insurmountable challenge for Tesla? No. Is it a big challenge for Tesla's full self-driving beta software team? Absolutely. But they've had a long time to kind of ramp up to this and it, they're the best in the world. So if anybody can manage this, I'm sure that Tesla's team can do so. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting and thought provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers and on and on. So check it out. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.